Our scripture reading this morning on this first Sunday of Advent is found in the Gospel of Matthew chapter number 24, beginning with verse number 36. But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days, for as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. May God bless the reading and the hearing of this word. May each of us, Hear in it a word that is to us and for us on this very day. We have a four-year-old grandson. His name is Miles. He has visited the church a few times, so some of you have had the opportunity to meet him. I am very biased about Miles and the nature of his young character. I admit that. But still, on most days, he is one of the sweetest, most engaging four-year-old boys that you will ever meet anywhere. (laughs) Then there was a couple of Saturdays ago. He was visiting with us in the morning, and the plan was for his parents to join us later in the afternoon for a football game. And I want to say that he was not being himself, but it's more accurate to say he was not being his best self. He spent most of the day unhappy about one thing or the other. Well, Steph and I being doting grandparents, we attempted to find some means of cheering him up. Our mantra as as grandparents is essentially, what can we do, play, or buy to make you happy? Is that good for his overall development as a person? Probably not, but be that as it may. We're content to let him learn his lessons on the hardships of life somewhere other than our house. <laughs> so we quizzed him on what we could do, what sort of games we could play, what, what would, we could give him to eat that would bring more contentment to him. Well, he used an economy of words for every question by simply offering a one-word answer, no. This went on for a while until I tested my theory that he was granting us this answer without really considering the questions. And so I ventured into a series of new questions. Miles, is your name Miles? No. (laughs) Stayed consistent. Miles, are you four years old? No. Miles, do you have 10 toes? No. He does, let me tell you. I kept asking questions in the same vein until his nose eventually turned into just a negative-sounding grunt. It was clear that he just didn't feel well, and although only four years old, he was simply being a little human being having a bad day. When his mother arrived, it didn't take her long to figure out what we had figured out much earlier in the day. She picked right up on his vibes and said, What's wrong with you, Miles? And he said, Mommy, I just have bad energy. Now, I understood. He was having one of those days, a bad energy day. I have those. I bet you have those. And on the days like today, when we have a gospel passage like this before us, it feels to me like Jesus is having a bad energy day. Although I've been preaching on the first Sunday of Advent for 30 plus years now, Let me stop there and say that if anyone wants to come through the line as you're leaving and say, you don't look old enough to have been preaching for 30 years, (laughs) you'll immediately move up the charts to favorite church member of mine. 
for 30 plus years, I've been preaching on the first Sunday of Advent, and I never quite get used to the stark contrast between where our minds and hearts want to go and where passages like this take us. Those of us who have been doing this church thing for a minute or so, we know that this is Advent and not Christmas. We know that we have no business singing Joy to the World or O Come All Ye Faithful or even All I Want for Christmas is You. This is Advent and not Christmas, and we're supposed to be waiting, perhaps even embracing the darkness that comes before the light. But we're human after all, and even though the church calendar tells us that we should be waiting, nobody else is waiting. Walgreens wasn't waiting when they put out Christmas paper the day after Halloween. Online businesses weren't waiting when back in early November they started inundating our inboxes with emails advertising the opportunity to do Black Friday shopping without leaving the comfort of our homes. The radio stations, they're not waiting. And so even if you can't hear your favorite Christmas carol in church, you can listen to it on the way to church. And so I think it is a forgivable flaw if we show up on the first Sunday of Advent ready for a little bit of festivity, like Shelby, only to be confronted by a rabbi named Jesus who is seemingly having a bad energy day where we find him talking about the end of everything as we know it. There's no waffling in his tone. There's, in fact, great clarity in the announcement that this is going to happen and that we human beings moving about on the earth, we need to be ready for it. Now, let me stop, and if not stop, let me just slow down take a breath, and ask what I think is the most salient question rising from this passage about the end. Is this good news? Is it bad news? Or is it just news? I suppose that's going to depend on where we are standing. Renowned Duke professor Will Willimon tells the story of a mission trip that he took with students from Duke to Honduras. During a community building time, they gathered in a circle and they each shared their favorite verse of scripture. And some of the usual suspects, of course, came up. John 3.16 and poetic verses from the Psalms or uh, from 1 Corinthians 13. But then they they, they came around to a a woman uh, from Honduras. And she said that her favorite verse could be found... She said, maybe it's in Luke 21 or or maybe Luke 20. She said, trying to recount the exact chapter and verse when Jesus said that God is going to burn all of this up. That, she says, is comforting to me. Well, Wilman says he was taken back and he thought maybe something had gone wrong in the translation. He asked the nurse if she had interpreted the woman's words correctly, to which the nurse confirmed that she had, but then she shed some light on it by saying this. She had been talking to this woman earlier in, in the hospital, and there she learned that this woman had given birth to five children in her young life, and that three of them had died from malnutrition. Wilman said... Suddenly, the light came on and he understood, and I think I do too. When we live in a world which is capable of producing an abundance of food, and yet children are dying of malnutrition at staggering rates, that world must end. It has to end. And indeed, it is good news that such a world would end. I felt similar emotions even last Sunday as we worshiped. Sunday morning for me usually involved getting my thoughts around the work of the day, and we often don't even turn on the radio on our way to church, and so sometimes I arrive, and if there was news that uh, made the waves uh, that morning, and I don't even know about it. This temporary hibernation for the world means I often don't hear any news on Sunday morning. And I had not heard the news of the shooting at an LGBTQ nightclub in Colorado Springs until one of our members shared it during our period of prayer request. Five dead, 
18 wounded. In an act driven by a tragic form of hatred, some reports indicating it was perhaps born out of the sort of self-hatred, which is so often at the root of violence. We might say that even the shooter's life has been sacrificed on the altar of hatred that didn't begin with him but made its way into his heart. While standing here in this very spot, I experienced that complicated emotion of surprise and the more sickening emotion of not being surprised at all. How can we be fully surprised when this sort of news makes its way to us so often? How can we be fully surprised when our world continues to be inundated with messages from religious and political pulpits which inspire contempt toward self and toward others? So yes, I understand the Honduran woman's prayer A world where these crimes have ceased to be surprising must end. It has to end. And it is indeed good news that someday that sort of world will end. Now, to be clear, I'm not of that school of thought which imagines a day when the skies will part and some of us will be lifted and some of us left behind. In addition, in my estimation, it isn't even the second coming of Christ that we are waiting for if we take seriously the notion that Christ come to us, comes to us in the very least of these, then perhaps Sarah Dillon Brewer has it right when she says, we're waiting on the cajillionth coming of Christ. But indeed, we are waiting on the inbreak of love which will bring this world as we know it to an end. I readily admit to you that I don't know what that coming is going to look like. I've encountered many a religious tract in public restrooms and elevators, some left under my windshield wiper. I've even received some in the mail from anonymous senders who thought I particularly needed to read those messages. All describing in great detail what will be happening before and during and after this coming of Christ. If you long for certitude, I'll simply have to refer you to those religious tracts. I, on the other hand, am and left with a lot of not knowing. But I can offer a question that I hope is worth pondering. What if the manner in which this world will end is still to be determined? That it's not written in stone anywhere. What if the manner in which this world so littered with hostility, apathy, cynicism, self-interest, and greed, what if the manner and means in which it will come to an end is not determined yet? Now, I'll confess to you that at the risk of losing my progressive card, I strongly suspect that the end of such a world will require an intervention of God and that all of the goodwill of all the people of goodwill will not be enough on their own. But still, I wonder what manner of waiting we are meant to be doing. Perhaps we aren't meant to be staring passively into the sky, waiting for God to do what only God can do. Perhaps our waiting is meant to be of another sort. Perhaps we only need to agree that this world as it is does need to end. Perhaps our waiting is meant to involve our working and loving and building of a new world just to see how far we can get. Maybe at the end of it all, we will discover that we couldn't change the world, but we will look back over our shoulders and see that by choosing hope over despair, we had managed to change corners of it. And by choosing faith over cynicism, we learn what it means to leave the rest. I once was having a conversation with some of our summer campers, and I have learned that conversations you have with teenagers often don't go the direction that you imagine they would go. And I asked this group if they believed that they could change the world. You see, I I had an agenda and expected these young people to be pragmatic and to readily admit that they couldn't change the world. See, I wanted to reel them in with that. So then I could remind them that if they couldn't change the whole world, they could, with love and courage, change 
pieces of it. There was a young man there, 15 or 16 years old, and his name was Thomas. Thomas let me make this claim before he politely raised his hand and then politely told me that I was wrong. We can change the world, he declared. If enough of us try, I know that we can. We had a fun and good-natured back and forth that led us to discover that we both wanted the same things for our world. I found it ironic that I was having such a conversation with a young man who shared a name with a disciple whose name was synonymous with doubt. Strange that seemed because this young man had optimism which knew no bounds. It is young Thomas who inspires the end of my sermon, and let's call it a prayer. It goes like this. God, let Thomas be right, and let me be wrong. Let young people like him see with their own eyes and not with the eyes of those of us who have seen too much. But if Thomas is wrong and we can't change the whole world, instill in our hearts enough love and enough courage to change what we can. And then, Lord, in faith, we will trust you to bring this world as it is to an end, so that your will can be done on this earth, just as it is done in heaven. This is our prayer. Amen.